uh, a little bit of uh, connection to Alabama, all right, from the forestry industry for me. Uh, as Perry said, I started my career with international paper back in 1990. Um, about that time, I started to work for the hammer mill side of the business, right as they were rolling out and starting up the second line down at Riverdale in Selma, uh, PM16. As I remember, did a lot of tours, and we had to sell that startup tonnage. I was working in LA, the other LA, the one out on the earthquake coast, um, but uh, we ended up having to sell about 7,000 tons to the LA school district to help get that machine up and started. So long history, um, it's, uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. You know, one of the things uh, I did want to ask is who right now is selling or has been involved in selling carbon credits uh, in the market? Okay, we've got a few. Who has uh, been interested or thinking about it? All right. Excellent. Well, um, then the last piece, who here is trying to maximize, obviously, their potential, much like TR talked about, hopefully see growth in your timber investments in the future? Hopefully all the hands, right? All right, well, hopefully we're, we're going to get to all of those things. March for me was a whirlwind. So I spent uh, four weeks, and it was about five or six different conferences, just about all of them focusing on the forest industry, and what is going on now in the bioeconomy, whether it was a biomass show, whether it was um, a investments in forestry and biodiversity, the SMLA conference, all of these had the same type of topics and carbon, carbon credits, what's going on in the carbon market were a big part of that. So just give you a little background, this is very, very fresh. But all this started, I think the interest that um, we received was Pete Stewart, who many of you probably know, our CEO, at the beginning of the year wrote his predictions for 2023. And, oh, did we lose the, okay. Um, from those, we're not gonna hit all six of these. We're gonna try to hit the couple ones that are bolded. Um, but the last one, the death of carbon credits is coming. So that one, I think, piqued the interest, and that's what we'll spend most of the time talking about but the two in the middle, the Inflation Reduction Act, right? So whether you like it or not, has increased the investments on renewables, right? And that, for right now, there's a lot of studies, development, things of that nature, but what else is gonna happen? We're gonna talk a little bit about that, and again, that's what I spent a lot of March focusing on. And then, will the industry dismiss some of this renewable focus? So if we have enough time, we'll get into that. All right, so the death of the foreign forest credits is coming. This is really that article that uh, Pete talked about. And a couple of things I'll hit on here is a lot of corporate America, whether it's the SEC guidelines now, the fact that every public company this year has to start um, di uh, putting in, in their annual reports and all their documents, their scope one and scope two emissions. Right. That, and along many other things, concerns about greenwashing, has had a lot of public, large companies start to think more about, we have to report our greenhouse gas emissions. What does it really look like? Is this an accounting investment? Or is this something that we want to do more of that's truly helping the marketplace? So that's probably been the biggest fo uh, focus. There's also still a lot of understanding where is carbon best served, right? Is it in a tree itself or is it in finished product? How does the accounting for that really go? There's still different methods that people are working on in the different universities. So um, ultimately, the question is what happens if you're just getting paid for it and the tree dies? Then what? What's the veracity of that? So real quick, I took a look at the end of last year. This is on the Corsia market, so that's the volunteer um, credit, about $2.60 a metric ton. This week, it was at two twenty. dollars All right, just give you a little bit of sense of where things are there. At uh, the same time, I think uh, an article was sent to me when we were talking about this talk, and it's, 
hey, wait a second. You know, this came out of uh, Fortune. J.P. Morgan just bought a huge forest, and the headline was they're doing it for carbon credits. Well, as you get into the article and read through it all, yes, they were going to take part of that um, land purchase they had to watch and see what was going on with the carbon markets, right? Most of it was going to be managed, managed for obviously sustainable timber and forestry, but a portion, they wanted to see what else was going on. This was a huge track, a huge company. They're essentially diversifying their efforts and kind of waiting to see. It's not definite that they were going to hold it for X number of years, but they were managing it and thinking about it. So I think that's, that's probably the key. Just kind of understand the details. Sometimes we love to, with our journalists, I think, to put these catchy headlines and we don't get into all the details that are going on out there. All right, so Pete also wrote um, another article called, you know, why we should ditch these credits, okay? Some of the keys um, is we've got to do things to have that better measurement. Everybody really understands, understands the transparency and what we're talking about. There's too many different standards. I mentioned the five different conferences I was at. That was one of the key themes. How do we get more transparent standards? How do we get more transparent measurement? Right? I think there's still so much unknown, it's still fairly a new market. All right? A couple of the other themes, though, corporations. This came out of the um, Advanced Bioeconomy Leadership Conference in D.C. where we had government, we had corporations, and we had industrial companies there. And it was, we need to do good for the environment, but we also need to do well for our stakeholders. Stakeholders meaning both employees as well as shareholders. Um, so that was one of the key things. But then we also need to look at technologies that can scale, right? And areas of interest that can scale and don't become fads. You know, trends are something that tend to lead to longer term goals. We've all seen fads. I know we've got some financial talks a little later today. Um, we've all probably seen fads in the investment community that kind of whatever's hot runs up and then it may or may not stay up. Um, but how do we look at trends and things that can truly be commercialized? And that's still an issue. Even with all these various bioeconomy, biomass technologies, determining which ones can be commercialized and then how do we support that? But ultimately, it's about trying to make real change for the environment not just accounting change. Now, with that said, and I'll summarize this at the end as well, that does not mean carbon credits are going away. The point I want to make is we are seeing that change, that shift from corporate America, public corporations to be thinking a lot more about how they want to go about reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, how they want to get to carbon neutral, some of them have put 2030 goals, 2040 goals, 2050 goals, whatever their goals are, they're the ones that because of their stakeholders are thinking about trying to make more real change. There's still a lot of large private companies out there. There's small private and small public companies. There will be markets. People are going to have to report to their, their customers. So I'm not saying carbon credits are gonna go away. But if you think of some of the early drivers, when you think of some of the pricing going up right away before there were more regulations, some of it I think was, hey, this is an easy way for us to get our carbon reductions down. So don't, don't take it as we think it's gonna go away, but as you, I think, wanna manage the best use of your land, we're just trying to give you that perspective. Okay, this is a view right now, this week, of some of the different types of carbon credits and offsets. Now what you'll see on the right, I talked about the Corsia down here. Again, that's voluntary credits, right? There is that concern on greenwashing. You get to the Oregon, the um, OCFP on the end, those are highly regulated, focused on transportation. There's also uh, subsidies that go along with that, both in California and Oregon, which California is the next one. 
So that's why those are at different levels. In the middle, you've got the California cap and trade, uh, as well as the RGGI. Those also have limitations. Because of those limitations, there's a little more veracity to them. The price is a little higher. A lot of people will throw out numbers and maybe not relate it to what the specific method is or the specific marketplace. So again, going back to that headline, just look at the details. You might hear someone say, oh, the carbon market's $100 a ton. Which market? Which offsets? And just to make sure that you're understanding where that's coming from. Okay. This is uh, one other article I happened to pull up this week. And it actually, they did a study, uh, came through the Wall Street Journal, um, reported on it. But this was in the fourth quarter of last year. Again, looking at these large public companies, uh, they surveyed about a hundred and a little over 130. And a quarter of them said they plan to use carbon credits. So three quarters were no longer planning to use carbon credits um, as of late last year. All right? At 90%, so 125 of these 137 said they had specific goals to get to net zero with their greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, which does seem like a long time out there, um, but still they're putting these goals out there. Uh, and again, the, the source for the actual study was the World Economic Forum in Bain, uh, but reported by the Wall Street Journal. So again, this is the momentum we're seeing that the big companies are the ones, and, and that's probably where some of the, the price pressure is going downward, when you don't have you know, apples and others of the world utilizing credits, it's going to affect the marketplace. They'll still be out there for those who want to sell them, um, but it's probably not going to be as attractive. All right, how are we on time, uh, Perry? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay, good. Well, we'll spend, I want to spend a little bit, uh, um, I mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act. Some of the things that came about that is a focus on the renewables market. Why are we talking about that? because of the impact it can have to the woody biomass forestry industry. Uh, TR was talking about uh, thinnings and slash and, and ways to how do we use some of our products, especially with some of the, the issues with pulp mills going down. Well, with that, there were two credits put in for sustainable aviation fuel. One for 23 and 24, one for 24, uh, 5 and 26. The push earlier this month is how do we move those out because these projects are billion dollar projects. Uh, I'm working on about half a dozen right now from the wood basket standpoint. All of these roughly are between um, a quarter, uh, 250,000 tons a year to the largest is pushing 3 million tons a year of woody biomass needed for these type of facilities. All right, so uh, it can impact, I'll go back here, it can impact, obviously, the ability to use our forestry, as long as, in this case, if it's for sustainable aviation fuel, it meets the RFS2 standards, all right? Um, the challenge is, from a lot of the pulp and paper mills, you know, we kind of dismissed it. We dismissed the pellet side of things for a number of years. Well, the pellet market obviously is, uh, has been successful and growing, but many of the pulp and paper mills just did not you know, want to get involved way back in 2007. It took about uh, eight to 10 years for the industry to kind of catch up. So we are seeing a little bit of skepticism, but you know, the pellet market, the heating market, woody biomass has become a significant part of the feedstock in the past uh, for this industry. So why does sustainable aviation fuel have a chance to impact our market and potentially impact your timber? Well, the commitment made last year by President Biden with SAF was to get to 3 billion gallons by 2030. It's 10 times what is used today, all right? 
Okay, and that's worldwide. So 300 million gallons is being used today worldwide, not even what's used in the United States. So that's a huge change. Subsidies are a big part of that. But the biggest part are the airlines. I got to know a lot of the airlines, got to listen to United, has been one of the most, uh, the largest proponents. Delta is very much a proponent. They're making commitments to move their fuel, and they're actually spending more and more time to sustainable a aviation fuel. Um, I will make sure I come back to your question. Um, we'll, uh, we'll get there, but this is an industry that can have, you know, you only got so many players, and that's, that's why we can see real change versus maybe thinking about we're all, you know, 300 million cars out there, how many of us are going to move toward ethanol fuel? Uh, let me go ahead and hit it now. Question. So the process is to take woody biomass and it actually creates an ethanol based fuel that is a drop in fuel. I did not, there, I have a whole talk about the, the details of it, but I knew there was no way in 25 minutes we were going to get into that. I wanted to hit the carbon. But, exactly. It, yeah, you know, there, guess what? They're already flying it today. They've been flying it. LAX was one of the first uh, to use it about eight years ago. They're already flying it. And back to the commercialized process, we will, we're now seeing a couple of the technologies that are commercialized. We did some land assessment projects several years ago that are now in development. And so this fuel, it's, an, it's the same ethanol-based fuel, it's just derived through a different means. And there's no way to, this is the actual view of how biodiesel, it's now about 10%, biodiesel's that teal kind of color. Then there's renewable diesel. Renewable diesel is taking used cooking oil and things of that nature. And then these other pieces, like biomass-based, is the piece that's smaller and smaller. So this really shows you the brown is um, woody biomass compared to some of the other colors, kind of each category. It's very well suited to be a low cost source for um, this type of sustainable aviation fuel compared to corn, compared to some of the other agricultural methane, landfill, things of that nature. Um, and in Europe, there's the highest and best use. They do not want to see food crops taken for fuel resources away from the communities. We haven't gotten that here. We don't really have the, maybe the challenge Europe does, but it is fairly well suited. Um, these are some of the projects that are either already developed or in development right now. As you can see, the U.S. South is where we're seeing more and more interest in woody biomass. And this is the actual refineries, right, that are using and taking the um, refined fuel to be able to drop in. All right, down to three minutes. So, at the end, so I'll, I'll leave a little time for questions. As you think about the carbon markets, Yes, we said we think it's time to ditch them. We know they're not going to completely go away. Our advice to you is think like a long-term investor. You're here today to hear a lot of things about how to invest in your states, in your land. Just don't jump on the fads. Think about the impact. Hopefully you've at least seen a little bit of how corporations are thinking about this. The big demand drivers are starting to move away and how we have real change versus accounting change. They're not going to go away. Credits will be around, but I will say that that pricing point is probably going to be more volatile now that there's less of this initial urge to, to buy into carbon credits. Um, and then the last piece, we do believe it's going to help our industry because woody biomass is going to be a real source and real opportunity for some of these sustainable fuels and biofuels that are coming in the future. So this is what we do. At, uh, we're now called ResourceWise. We have forest to market. We have the Fisher side, which is pulp and paper. 
Um, we have a chemical side called uh, Technon Orbichem, and we bought a company called Prima Markets that focuses on these biofuel sustainable av aviation fuel. So I've got a minute or two to answer questions. If you have others, I want to put my contact information, please uh, reach out to me. So I think we got time maybe for one question. Anyone out there?